Victoria Magritas. I am an Associate Director of Admission at Connecticut College, and I actually coordinate international admission at Con. So, you know, as Cynthia said, if you have any questions, please feel free to add them to the Q&A. Um, we'll be happy to cover them at the end of the session. Um, and then, of course, later on, I will give you my contact information. So after the fact, you can feel free to use that as much as you'd like. Um, just give me a second. I am going to share my screen and then we will get started. Once again, welcome. Thank you so much for joining me today. Um, today, we're going to chat for about 30 minutes. We'll talk about, you know, Connecticut College, the academic experience at Connecticut College. Um, we'll talk a little bit about student life, and then we'll talk about the admission and the financial aid process at Con. Here is a picture of our beautiful campus. Uh, Connecticut College has a 750 acre Arboretum campus. You can see um, here's just a small piece of what campus looks like. This body of water you see in the background is the Thames River, not to be confused with the Thames River. Uh, we really love our Arboretum campus because it allows students to have the opportunity to both recreate in, you know, a wooded area. It's a really beautiful piece of land um, where students can go walking in, go hiking in, um, but it also provides students with academic opportunities. So, you know, being on a river, um, there's different ecosystems, classes are taught in the Arboretum. It's really just a beautiful space for our students, staff, and faculty to have access to, uh, both extracurricularly, uh, and within the classroom. Connecticut College is located about two hours from New York City and about an hour and a half from Boston, Massachusetts. So we're really well situated. It's easy to get to and from campus from a lot of major airports. We're right off of a, the major highway that goes through the northeastern part of the United States. Um, we also have easy access to these cities. So you know, as far as doing things extracurricularly, going to New York on a weekend or Boston on a weekend, it's really easy to travel throughout the Northeastern corridor of the United States while you're at Connecticut College. Now that's not to say that Con is like a school where folks aren't on campus on the weekends or anything like that. By and large, we have most of our student body on campus on the weekends, but students do have the opportunity to be able to explore a little bit off campus as well, um, just because of our location. A couple of smaller cities that are also in the area are New Haven, Providence, Rhode Island, and Hartford, Connecticut. So, you know, as far as intern internships and uh, community engagement opportunities. They're pretty abundant in the area. You know, we're not a, we're not a small liberal arts college in the middle of nowhere. There's a lot to do in the area and in New London specifically. New London was founded as our whaling city actually way back in the 1600s. Um, so it's a really incredibly diverse town with a lot going on. There's a downtown area uh, where students can go to coffee shops and restaurants. There's museums in the area as well. We really pride ourselves on being engaged actively in the New London community. You know, we are members of the New London community uh, being in New London. So we encourage our students and we really challenge our students to go into New London and engage uh, with the New London community in whatever way makes sense to them. Uh, we have the Holleran Center for Community Action um, and they actually are able to help us match students with experiences that might work for them, whether that be, you know, working with an after school program or working with an art collective downtown. Um, we really want our students to participate in those things and the Holland Center is there to help our students do that. In your first year, uh, you will take a first year seminar class. All of our students take a first year seminar class. Uh, our FYS, the first year seminars are all different themes. Um, so you'll preference whichever theme really speaks to you the most, but all of our first year seminar classes are interdisciplinary. The first year seminar is really your first introduction to the way the liberal arts work at Connecticut College. Um, I consider the first year seminar class your first introduction to a mile deep education versus a mile wide education. We'll expect you to dive deep into one specific subject area as opposed to learning a little bit over a wide subject area in your first year seminar class. A couple of first year seminars that have been taught over the last few years are uh, from Holy Land to Disneyland. Uh, that first year seminar studied pilgrimages and how pilgrimages have evolved throughout history. So not just, you know, religious pilgrimages, but also cultural pilgrimages. You know, in the United States, a lot of us consider 
Disneyland to be somewhat of a pilgrimage in your childhood. So you can see, you know, that first year seminar studies not only religion, but also culture, sociology, anthropology. Um, another first year seminar class that I found really interesting was epidemics. That class taught not just how diseases spread, like the biology of disease, but also why diseases spread. How can governments help and hinder the spread of disease? How does religion impact the spread of disease? You know, so there's biology, there's, there's anthropology, there's religion, and this is what we mean by interdisciplinary. We really mean studying a topic through the lens of different subject areas. No one subject exists in a vacuum, so we're really going to challenge you to be able to look through, look through issues through the lens of these different subjects. One of the unique things about Connecticut College in our first year seminar class is that you are assigned a team of advisors in your first year. So you don't just get an academic advisor, you do get an academic advisor. That academic advisor is the faculty member who teaches your class. You also get a staff advisor. So your staff advisor is somebody like myself, someone who doesn't grade you, who offers a diverse perspective about the resources we have at Connecticut College, who's there to help you through your first year. You also get a career advisor. We'll talk a little bit more about career later, um, but we really value career at Connecticut College. And we start in your first year, which is pretty rare. Um, you also get two student advisors. Those are two students who have know the ropes, they've gone through their first year at Con successfully at least, uh, and they're there to help you on a more peer-to-peer -peer basis. We invite our students first year students and specifically our international students to campus early. Um, so you'll meet with your student advisors during orientation and they're there to help you as an advising cohort. Uh, there's only 15 students in each of our first year seminar classes. So we really treat you as a cohort of students and our hope is that you're able to do a lot of things together uh, when you first come to campus to help to bond a little bit um, because you're gonna be in the classroom together for the whole first semester. I think that for international students, one of the most important things about the first year experience is that you have a lot of support, um, specifically international students on top of this advising team. They also have access to um, a dean, Dean Patton, who is the Dean of International Students and our International Student Association. So there's a lot of support for first year students, but then also specifically for international students on our campus. We talked about interdisciplinary education a little bit in the last slide. We also really want to focus on integrative education at Connecticut College. At a lot of places, you have experiences, you know, a major, a minor, a career related experience, extracurricular activities, but you don't necessarily do anything that combines them. Uh, you know, they're sort of disparate and not necessarily connected. At Connecticut College, we're really going to challenge you to take the things that you're doing inside of the classroom and connect them to the things that you're doing outside of the classroom. And that's what integrative education is all about. Your education isn't just the classes that you take. It's not just about academics. It's also about the experiences that you have while you're on campus and while you're off campus. And we do that through our core curriculum. Um, our core curriculum is called Connections, and it is our reimagining of the liberal arts. Um, the way it works is in your sophomore year, you will declare your major, but you will also declare an, inter an integrative pathway. The pathways are really sort of like a theme to your education. Um, you will complete both coursework and you will have experiences extracurricularly within your pathway. So a couple of examples of pathways and the way they work are global capitalism, peace and conflict, public health, food, entrepreneurship. So this pathway serves as a theme. So you're able to take the classes that you're required to take outside of your major and minor, as well as the experiences that you have in your major and minor and outside of your major and minor and complete them within the context of this theme. It gives you a lot more ownership over your education. You're able to really pick classes outside of your major and minor that makes sense for you and your education and what you want to do after you graduate as well. So it's really for us all about that integrative component. So you're completing coursework within your pathway, you're completing integrative coursework within your pathway, and then you're also completing activities outside of your pathway, like an internship and a senior integrative project. So um, we also have four interdisciplinary centers for scholarship. The the difference between the pathways and the centers is that you will apply to be a part of an interdisciplinary center, whereas in a pathway, you just declare a pathway. 
The interdisciplinary centers are a little bit more intensive as well. The coursework of an interdisciplinary center is equivalent to that of around a minor. And the four interdisciplinary centers for scholarship are the Ammerman Center for Art and Technology, the Goodwin-Nearing Center for the Environment, the Holleran Center for Community Action, and the Tor Cummings Center for International Studies and the Liberal Arts. Um, so as long as you have a grounding interest in one of those theme areas, you can be a part of any of those centers. They're all interdisciplinary. So we really want a diverse group of students studying diverse things academically to be a part of those centers because you all offer different perspectives and that's really important in the classroom, both for the pathways and the centers. This will culminate in a senior integrative project. If you're in an interdisciplinary center, you will be required to do a senior integrative project. And if you are in a pathway, you will be heavily encouraged to complete a senior integrative project. Um, a lot of our students do research on campus. They do independent research and they also do research with faculty. Um, we only have undergraduate students on campus, so there is a lot of opportunity for our undergraduate students to do research with faculty and to do independent research, which is really wonderful. Um, this culminates in our all college symposium, which is a big tradition that we have on campus, and it gives students the opportunity to present their work to the greater Connecticut college community. The entire campus shuts down for the day. We all go to different poster sessions that our students put on and we're really able to learn not just what students are researching but why are they researching what they're researching um, one of my favorite uh, poster presentations i went to last year uh, was on and one of our student workers she's an english major and she studied the literary canon so what 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 books are we teaching in a high school setting to high schoolers in english classes um, and she studied how how to diversify the literary canon and how important it is to add a diverse group of voices to English classes in high schools. And it made me really think about how, you know, when I was in high school, I really only read books by white men and how more enriching my classes would have been if I was able to see you know, read books by people who looked a little bit more like me um, and to read books by, by people who look nothing like me. Um, and that was what her project was on is the importance of diversifying the literary canon for secondary schoolers. So that was one of my favorite projects. A couple of other examples of students who've gone through our curriculum. Avery. Avery was in our entrepreneurship pathway. Avery is really interested in sustainability and the healthy lifestyle industry. So Avery um, did his senior integrative project on just that. You know, how is there a place for sustain, sustainability within the healthy lifestyle industry? So he uses his major in economics, his minor in math, and his, his pathway work in entrepreneurship to do just that, to, to explore that topic. And he actually was able to have an internship with a major company called Kind Snacks. They make these really delicious granola bars that are dipped in chocolate. Um, and he was able to do that work, not just in the classroom, but also explore that through his internship. And that's a really good example of what the pathways are all about. It's, you know, learning about entrepreneurship through the lens of different subjects and then applying that knowledge to an extracurricular experience and a career experience. Andre uh, was actually not a part of a pathway or a center. That's also an option if you know you feel like you want that more traditional liberal arts experience. Um, you can do that as well. Andre studied theater psychology and architecture, and he was really interested in how we receive you know information when we are in a play or you know at a concert and based off of the space that you're in. So if you think about being in a small intimate setting for a concert or a play versus a large auditorium, how is that experience different and how does it serve you based off of what you're doing? So, you know, a play might be much better in a huge auditorium because of the effects that it has, or it might be much better in a small setting. So he did a lot of work to, to study just that, you know, how you can use space to really amplify your experience. And then Olivia, Olivia studied Francophone migration uh, through Morocco. Um, Olivia was in CISLA, which is the International Studies Center on campus. So she was one of our center students. And that's what she did her senior integrative project on was Francophone migration through Morocco. Um, and she actually got a Fulbright to Cote d'Ivoire and is going to go to graduate school at Tufts. So she was able to take her experiences in her center her experiences abroad and apply that to her graduate school experience. And we're very happy for her. 
one of the good things about our core curriculum that I think is really interesting is that you can't necessarily like finish it. Um, you finish it when you graduate. So our core curriculum isn't just, you know, the classes that you take outside of your major and minor. It is the classes that you take outside of your major and minor, but it is also inclusive of other experiences like global engagement. We really expect our students and challenge our students to engage globally um, on our campus and off our campus. And our students engage globally by participating in international student association events, or by participating in the international student association, um, by going out downtown and, you know, actively engaging in the New London community. The most popular way to participate in global engagement is, of course, studying abroad, though. Over half of our students will study away at some point in time. During their academic career for at least a semester, our students go all over the place. But there are two ways you can study away at Con. Uh, one is through a study away teach away program. Our study away teach away program is um, for Connecticut college students. It's led by Connecticut college faculty. You can really think of it as like Con abroad. Um, it's great if you want to study away with a faculty member you have a good relationship with, maybe your, your advisor is leading a trip somewhere. They go to a lot of different places and, has, you know, we've had trips in the past go to Latin America, to Vietnam, to South Africa, but they change based off of where faculty are going. We also have external programs that are approved by our Office of Study Away, and they're approved to be as rigorous as you know, a, a Connecticut college class might be. Um, we want to make sure that the credits transfer, right? So that's why we have all these approved programs. And you'll work with, uh, with an advisor in our study away office to make sure that you're taking the classes that you need to take in order to graduate on time. You sort of collect advisors as you go along at Connecticut College. I think that's like the common theme through this presentation is we talk a lot about advising because we really want to give you the resources to be able to be successful. Um, and I think that the advising model that we have is, is one of the strongest things about our liberal arts education. Career is also something that we talk about a lot during your academic experience at Connecticut College. We consider career to be a part of your academic experience and a part of our core curriculum. We have a four year career preparation plan that starts in your first year, like we talked about a little bit earlier. The hallmark of our career program is that as you go through our career preparation plan, you actually unlock funds to be able to complete a career related experience. So your career related experience might look different for you than it does for another student. Um, it might be an internship, it might be doing research, it might be uh, going to a conference, you'll work with your career advisor and make sure that you're using that funds in the best way for you. We have pre-professional advising as well, pre-professional being, you know, pre-med, pre-health, pre-business, pre-law. Um, so we have an advising team in our career office that's able to help those students. I think an important note about our pre-med program is you don't just get a career advisor in pre-med, you also get an academic advisor in pre-med. So you sort of get the best of both worlds. You get somebody in the career office who's very well versed um, in the health professions, who's there to help you make sure you maximize your Connecticut college experience but then you also get an academic advisor who's there to make sure that you're you're checking everything off you're taking all of the classes that you would need um, we have an employer relations team as well. Uh, our employer relations team puts on programs throughout the year. Um, the main thing that our employer relations team does is they foster relationships between Connecticut College students and companies that would like to hire Connecticut College students, um, whether that connection be through alumni, parents, um, or just somebody who's hired con grads before and really likes them uh, is the common. We are actually this, I think next week, putting on a tech week. So there's going to be a whole week of panels um, from alumni and parents of students who work in the technology field. Um, so that's really great. We're going to have uh, folks who represent Amazon, Apple, um, yeah, a lot of different companies uh, that are going to present to our students, which we're pretty excited about. And because we have such a robust career program, we actually have pretty good statistics 97% uh, of our students are employed or in graduate school within a year of graduation and we are actually a top producer of Fulbrights. That number is pretty big uh, when you consider the fact that we only have 1,900 students on our campus um, so we're very proud of that. 
And then one thing I'll mention about the honor code and shared governance is, um, or about student life is our honor code and shared governance. Um, our honor code is a document that all of our students have to sign upon matriculation. It basically says that you will live your life with integrity while you're on Connecticut College's campus and when you leave Connecticut College's campus. Um, as a result of our honor code, we have an entirely peer judicial system. Um, we call it honor council. There are two students voted on, e voted on for each class year to honor council. Uh, the honor code is really a set of community guidelines that are based on mutual respect. It's the idea that you don't live your life in a vacuum. So by signing the honor code, you're agreeing that you are going to impact other people in our community in a positive way and not a negative way. Um, along with that comes a couple of perks. We have entirely self-scheduled and unproctored final exams. We trust our students to know themselves as learners and to schedule their own final exams. And then because you've signed the honor code, we really trust you to be academically honest and to take that exam in an unproctored grown. It's a very self-selecting group of students that go to a place that has such a strong social honor code. Um, and I really believe that it's very much reflected in our student body and in the faculty and staff as well. We oftentimes, you know, look to the honor code when we're talking about students and, and what types of work we have our student workers do. Um, you know, the honor code is a great thing to be able to point to and say, you know, well, they signed this document, so we're gonna let them do X, Y, or Z. And then we also have shared governance. Shared governance is the idea that you as a student are an equal and important member of our campus community, just like a staff member is and just like a faculty member is. So we involve our students in pretty high level decision making at the college. Um, you know, we talked about our core curriculum a little bit earlier and all of the pathways. Um, for every pathway that's created, there is a student on the curriculum committee for that pathway. Uh, we involve our students in hiring committees. There's a student who rotates through the budget committee, just like the dean of admission and financial aid rotates through the budget committee. Connecticut College is an incredibly student-centered place. Um, I'm in meetings all the time where we talk about how, you know, at the end of the day, we exist to serve students and by involving students in the running of campus, I think we do that in the best way we can. So now for the thing that I do best, the application review process. Um, we have a holistic application review process. What does that mean? Um, that means we look at everything that you send us. So we take the common application and only the common application. You can add us to your My Colleges list. Uh, we will look at your academic record. So the classes you've taken, your national exams, uh, your the level of coursework you've taken, the type of curriculum you're in, you know, are you in an A-levels curriculum? Are you in an IB curriculum? We take all of that into consideration. You know, what is available to you? is what we will consider. We won't compare you to something that isn't available to you. So, you know, if you can't take an IB curriculum at the school you're in, that's totally fine. I won't expect you to take a full IB curriculum then. We really will meet you where you're coming from in the application process as far as academics is concerned. We also look at the things that you've done outside of the classroom. So anything that you've done outside of the classroom, whether it be a part-time job, you know, a religious organization, something within the classroom, a sport, uh, we really want to know about what meaningful things you've done outside of the classroom um, through the extracurricular activity. So anything that's meaningful to you is meaningful to me and you should put it on that list. Your essay. Your essay is an important piece of your application, not just because it lets me know something about you that I don't already know based off of your application. That is sort of what the essay is all about. It's about getting to know you a little bit better, but it's also get about getting to know what type of writer you are and how strong your writing skills are. So when you're writing your essay, definitely keep in mind that we are also looking at your essay to tell us how strong of a writer you are. And then for students for whom English is not their native language, the essay can be a really good way of us getting an idea of your writing ability in English. I get asked all the time, you know, what should I write my essay about? Anything you want. I really don't try to write an essay for me, write an essay for you. I want to hear about what's important to you. I don't want you to try to write an essay that you think I'm going to like. I want to write, I want to read the essay that you want to write, if that makes sense. And then we require three letters of recommendation. One will come from a college or guidance counselor generally, uh, and that will talk, tell me about your trajectory through secondary school, uh, how you might have grown through those years, any bumps along the way. So maybe you were injured playing a sport and you 
couldn't look at a screen because you had a, you know, a concussion or something like that, and that impacted your performance. Maybe you had a family situation early on that impacted your performance. Um, you can also tell us about those things in the additional information section of the Common application. Um, and I definitely encourage you to use the additional information section of the Common application to give us any context to your application. We will also require two letters of recommendation from somebody who's taught you in the classroom who can speak to you as a citizen of the classroom community. So uh, anyone can really write that who's taught you in the classroom. I encourage you to really think critically about who will speak to you as a citizen of the classroom community. So who can talk to you, uh, who can talk about you in terms of how well you work with others, how well you work independently, you know, are you helpful to your fellow classmates, and that sort of a thing. Keep that in mind when you're choosing your recommenders. We'll also allow for an additional letter of recommendation uh, from a peer or from, you know, maybe uh, somebody from a religious organization you're a part of, someone from a community organization you're a part of who can speak to you um, in that context as well. We are test optional for standardized testing. So if you take the SAT and you're like, that score isn't really representative of me as a student, that's totally fine. You don't have to submit your SAT or your ACT scores. We will not assume that they're bad. We won't go looking for them. Uh, really, if you tell me, if you go say you don't want me to consider your testing scores, I really consider your academic record to be the entire piece of the academic puzzle. puzzle. If you do submit your standardized test scores, we will consider them, of course, and it'll be a wedge of sort of the pie of your academic record, if that makes sense. We do still require English language testing for students for whom English is not their native language. We waive that only on a case-by-case -case basis. To fulfill that requirement, there, there are several ways you can fulfill that requirement. Um, I would say the two, the most popular ways are the are Duolingo, that's new this year that we're accepting, is Duolingo English test. Uh, the TOEFL uh, and the IELTS, uh, we can talk a little bit later about the, about the scores for that if you guys are interested. Um, we also track demonstrated interest. Uh, Congratulations, you're all showing demonstrated interest by being here today. Um, but really demonstrated interest is all about doing the work on the front end of your application process to apply to a group of schools that you can really see yourself at. And you, you, you cultivate that list by going to information sessions, by contacting your admission officer, uh, by doing all of the things that allow you to learn more about the institution you're applying to. You can also do that by interviewing. We allow international students to do a self-interview after they apply. I highly recommend that you do that. Um, you can also schedule an in-person interview, although I totally understand time in-person virtually. Let me just note that. Um, but we totally understand that time zones can be really tricky to navigate. So that's why we give our students um, the opportunity to do a self-interview as well. The interview is also evaluative, and evaluative is a scary word. It really just means that it enters into your application, into your application record. Um, it's a way for you to get to know Connecticut College if you do the, the virtual face-to-face -face interview. Um, it's a way for you to get to know Connecticut College, and it's a way for us to get to know you. If you do the self-interview, it's a really great way for you to be able to tell us a little bit more about why you're interested in Connecticut College. That's definitely going to be a big question that you get asked uh, when you do that. Uh, interview is why you're interested in Connecticut College. So definitely come prepared to answer that question. Not sure why this presentation does this. Oops. So for our financial aid process, I know based off of the poll, some of you were interested in learning about this. We meet 100% of demonstrated need regardless of citizenship. And the way we do that is through the CSS profile and the certificate of finance. So you will submit the CSS profile and a certificate of finance. Our financial aid office will crunch the numbers, come up with an expected family contribution for your family, and we meet 100% of the gap between your expected family contribution and our total cost of attendance. The first building block of that will be a merit scholarship if you're eligible. You can see the ranges on the screen right now. Um, that will be the first building block of your financial aid package if you're eligible. You're eligible for a merit scholarship regardless of whether or not you're eligible for or apply for financial aid. That's also important to keep in mind. 
Here are some deadlines. Um, our early decision one deadline is November 15th. If you apply early decision, that is a binding contract. You are saying that if you are admitted, yes, you will attend to Connecticut College and withdraw applications to all other institutions. Early decision is for students who really love Khan. They've, you know, they've talked to an admission officer. They came to this info session and they were like, oh wow, that was the best information session I've ever been to. Um, they do all of that work on the front end to really be positive that this is the place they want to be. If early decision isn't a good fit for you, that's totally fine. We still have regular decision. That deadline is January 1st. If you just need a little bit of extra time, but you're still pretty, you're still positive that you want to come to Connecticut College, we have two rounds of early decision. So if you apply November 15th, you'll find out by mid-December whether or not you're coming to Connecticut College. If you apply early decision two, you'll find out by mid-February whether or not you're coming to Connecticut College. And if you apply regular decision, you will find out by the end of March whether or not you are admitted to Connecticut College. And that's what I have for you today. I will stop sharing my screen now and welcome Cynthia back. Thank you. Thank Thanks, you. Vicki. That was terrific. And um, shall I put your contact info in or will you do that later? Oh, I'll do it right now. Okay, good. Well, all right. So now is the time actually for Vicki to take your questions. Um, anything that you might want to know further about her presentation? about the college and the application process, feel free to uh, put it in the Q&A box and we will answer it. And maybe while we're waiting, Vicki, um, with regard to that internship, the internship is not confined to the New London area, right? That's exactly right, that's a really good point. Um, that funding can follow you really wherever you go. A number of our students use that funding to do an internship abroad, actually. Um, so I'm thinking specifically of Miriam Quasim, who did her internship with the United Nations in Paris, um, and she used that funding to do that. So you, you can, we've had students do internships across the United States, um, as well as abroad, using that funding. Right. And so um, the other thing, of course, is um uh, students actually can create their own right i mean absolutely they, yeah mm -hmm. so if you have that funding and you were working with a company on a project that you want to do with them um perhaps you have a family member who you know has a connection with somebody and you're really interested in that particular field you can because you have this funding available to you you can actually go to somebody and say this is a project i want to do like an avery's example you know i really want to study the healthy lifestyle industry and sustainability this is the project i want to do you don't even have to pay me i have funding to be able to do it it really you're able to leverage yourself in a, just a different way than you would if you needed funding to be able to do research or to be able to participate in an internship. Okay, sorry, here's a question. Um, okay, so we have a question. Um, if you could give a, sort of a profile of a typical con student. Sure, absolutely, I can answer that. So um, I would say, uh, so academically for like an admission profile, uh, students generally have, you know, around in the US system, like an A minus average. It can look different depending on what curriculum you're in as well. Um, for English language testing, we're looking for at least 100 on the TOEFL to be generally successful in our application process. You know, we still have a holistic review process, but that's the number that we're generally looking for, or a 120 on Duolingo. Um, we want students who are good citizens of their community as well. So when we're reading your application, we're reading your application to see where you might fit in our community. And I say fit in, I don't mean like there's one type of Connecticut College student that fits in at Con. I mean like what is going to be your niche area at Connecticut College? Are you really interested in science research? You know, and we have a faculty member who does the type of thing that you're interested in, or are you a really prolific dancer and you want to be a part of our, one of our dance organizations on campus? Those are the types of things we're looking for when you're reading your application. Um, and that's where the holistic review comes in. So 
you know, I can, if I had a little bit more information about the type of curriculum you're in, I think that I could answer that question a little bit better. Um, I say, you know, generally like an A minus average is a successful, you know, that's a good GPA for a Connecticut college applicant, um, but it can depend based off of where you're from. Okay. Now as a follow-up to that, um, it's not exactly the academic profile, but would you say that there are characteristics that um, con students share? There's, of course, wide diversity, but Anything yeah, absolutely. I would say, especially because of our core curriculum, I think that one thing that con students have in common is they generally want to study broadly. So we challenge our students through our core curriculum to study subject areas widely. And, you know, you can't really have a solid knowledge of economics without a solid knowledge of history. And that's what our curriculum is all about. So, you know, our students are generally intellectually curious and they want to study different things. Um, you know, when I have a student, I think I like to answer the question, who, what type of student is might not be a good fit for Connecticut College. And, you know, I had a student once who sat down with me and he was like, you know, I really want to do, I want to be a biology major. I want to do biology research. And I was like, that's awesome. You can absolutely do that at Connecticut College. And I was like, what other sorts of things are you interested in? What are you involved in in your community? And really, you know, at he just kept pointing to biology, biology and research and research. And that's great. And you can absolutely do that. But we really want students who are going to be engaged outside of the classroom as well, not just inside of the classroom. So that's another component I think that Connecticut College students have in common is, you know, they are obviously academically focused, but they're also interested in engaging with the broader community. Could you speak um, uh, to some of the clubs and organizations that students get involved in on campus? Yeah, absolutely. So we have a ton of club sports. Um, so if you're interested in, uh, you know, playing a sport, but not necessarily the commitment of a varsity sport, we have club sports. We have a very active student government association as well on campus. Um, we have an international student association as well. Um, our student government association is popular specifically because of shared governance. Our student government association is very active. Um, the international student association, um, put, they put on programming throughout the year, but then there's also a mentorship piece of our international student association um, that you can participate in. You, can, you have mentors, uh, but then also you can serve as a leader within the international student association um, once you get your feet under you. Okay. Let's see. Um, someone has asked about for some more information about the self interview. Sure. Self so, work. Yeah. So it's a yeah, it's a little bit of a confusing thing. The way the self interview works is after you apply, you will be given the opportunity to do it a one sided interview. So we will give you a list of questions that we want you to verbally answer. Um, because of time zone issues, a lot of times international students can't necessarily, you know, A, come to campus because that is a, you know, a huge cost barrier and that's totally fine. Um, you know, even in the virtual space, time zones can definitely be tricky to navigate. So we still want to give you the opportunity to speak to why you're interested in Connecticut College um, and to speak to your experience in secondary school. And that's why we have the self interview. So you won't be speaking to somebody like myself or a current student, you're, you'll just be speaking into your like webcam, um, but you'll be answering a list of questions that we find really valuable in our process. Let's see. So on that map that situates Connecticut College, New London, between Boston and New York, and you were mentioning how easy it is to get to those places, being on the train line, for instance. Um, but students tend to stay on campus. What other kinds of things are there to do than the clubs and organizations? Absolutely. So there's programming mm -hmm. uh, every weekend that our different groups put on. Uh, in each residence hall, you have a floor governor and a house fellow. Um, those are like student leaders who are there as a resource for you. Um, while you're living on campus, you can go and you can see and they sort of mitigate issues you might have uh, within your residence hall, but they also put on programming for you. Um, I know last year, one of our, one of our house fellows, uh, he put on a chicken nugget eating contest for the campus. Um, so they went and bought just a ton of chicken nuggets and had a chicken nugget eating contest. 
Um, there is dances as well. They have tent dances. Um, there's Floralia, which is a big event. Um, that's a big concert that happens in the spring where our students are able to sort of camp out for the weekend and listen to music together. It's a really nice way to send off the seniors, but of course everyone goes. Um, so there's really, there's different stuff going on depending on what you're interested in. There's also sports events. Uh, we have, we're division three, we're part of the NESCAC, the New England Small College Athletic Conference. So our athletic events are pretty well attended. Um, the most attended athletic event is definitely, and Cynthia, correct me if I'm wrong, I would say it's definitely the Coast Guard con hockey game that happens. It's a huge tradition. There's a big line to get tickets. Um, it's definitely one of our biggest attended events over the year. Um, we also have a really robust art community. Uh, we, this is a place that still invests in the arts, which I'm really impressed with. We actually are in the middle of a $23 million renovation of our Performing Arts Center. Um, so that is, we're going to have a brand new theater uh, that we're really excited about, an auditorium that really, you know, if you remember AT and his research project on, you know, the types of spaces that you go and you receive information in, this space is going to be beautiful um, and a really wonderful place to be able to go to dance shows and theater performances. It's going to be a little bit more intimate than the one we have now is. Um, our dance program is incredibly popular as well, so you can participate in dances, um, or in the dance program, but then there's also, you know, dance shows that you can go to. So our community is pretty diverse in terms of, you know, the types of things we offer extracurricularly. Um, so you're going to be able to have a lot of opportunities to see speakers and to see different types of dance shows and different types of theater performances um, while you're on campus instead of, you know, leaving. <laughs> Right. Now, I think um, earlier this week in the open house, you did a session with um, some students and professors from the Walter Commons. I did. And our international students often find that to be kind of a home away from home, right? Absolutely. So the Walter Commons is a physical space on campus where students are able to congregate and to do international things and it's vague because there's a lot of things that go on in the Walter Commons. It's where our uh, CISLA, the Tor Cumming Center for International Studies and Liberal Arts is located um, and it's also where there are a lot of offices like you know for study away are. Um, so it's a space for students to be able to use. Uh, it's also a place where students can use technology to be able to interact globally. Um, so there are sessions put on by students who are currently studying away to be able to talk to our current students about their experiences. Um, so there's a lot that goes into the Walter Commons for our students to be able to use. Um, also because it's an international space, it's a really a comfortable place for our students to be able to congregate and meet and plan events that they're going to be putting on for the wider Connecticut College community um, and to be able to use that technology. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, is there anything that you would want to say about our international network of alumni? I did notice that one of our participants this morning is from Brazil, and I, I know we have some, uh, a recent alumnus there, but we have more than just one. And anyway, uh, about that connectedness that, that continues. Yeah, Connecticut College is a, is a small place, but we have a really wide network. You know, Connecticut College students tend to congregate in places where young people congregate in the United States, but really they're all over the world. Um, we really actively engage our alumni network and our young alumni network, especially for our students to be able to use um, to their advantage. So we have students all over the world. I'm thinking the president, of, the former president of our International Student Association is from Brazil. And yes, that's, like, that's who I'm thinking of. So as far as our alumni are concerned, they're really all over the world. And when we were talking about our career program earlier and we're talking about alumni, the folks who are on those panels are recent grads. So they're able to talk to you about their recent Connecticut College experience and how they were able to use their liberal arts experience to go out into the world and find a job that really works for them and is what they want to be doing. So I remember when I was in college and you know, we talked to alums who were like 30 years into their career. And you know, that's great and that's helpful, but I also want to hear from folks who've recently graduated and younger alums uh, 
who have just gone through the process who might be able to counsel me as well. So that was sort of how I approached my career process. And I think it's helpful to have that wide network of alumni ranging in years so you can see what your career process might look like, you know, right after your senior year versus, you know, 30 years from after your senior year. Okay. Well, let's see. Um, I don't think I see any more questions here. One, one more does occur to me, which is just purely informational, but you did mention the certification of finances. And um, I believe it's true that all international students must submit that, whether or not they're applying for financial aid. Is that right? Yes, absolutely. All students must submit a certificate of finance. Okay. Okay. Well, uh, Vicki, is there anything else? Is there any uh, further wisdom that you'd like to impart? Anything that occurs to you that you want to send folks away with? Yeah, I would say use me as a resource uh, in the process. Don't hesitate to reach out. I know it's a really kind of a daunting process to apply internationally to schools and I commend you for it. Um, but as you navigate the process, please don't hesitate to reach out. I'm available uh, via email. You have my email address in the contact box. Okay, great. Then um, the only other thing I guess that, that I would mention at this point um, is that for those of you who are interested in social justice issues, we do have a new event this year that is happening in another couple of weeks and we would want to invite you to it. Actually, Vicki, would you want to tell them briefly about it? Yeah, absolutely. So it's a new program that we're offering this year for students to be able to participate in um, and have a dialogue around issues of social justice. Um, I think that it's a great program, especially in light of the things that have been happening in the United States uh, with the Black Lives Matter movement um, and our support of the Black Lives Matter movement. So we really want to open a dialogue on campus about social justice issues um, and how, you know, Connecticut College fits in to the conversation of social justice. Um, so Connecticut College is a very welcoming place and I'm really excited that they're taking the initiative and offering programming around these big issues that we have, not just in the United States, but globally. And I think that a global perspective is a crucial part of that because, you know, it's an issue everywhere. Um, it's an issue a lot of places. So we definitely want to engage our international students in those conversations. Right. Thank you. So you're welcome to join us, um, all participants. And I think you know that really takes care of our presentation today. Vicki, thank you so much. That was so thorough. And uh, students, be in touch with us if we can help you at all further. Oh, wait, there's one question that has appeared. Oh, it's just saying uh, thanks. Oh, it's just really very nice. Thank you for your thanks. We appreciate it. Right. And um, be in touch with us and take good care, okay? Bye-bye. Bye, everyone.